We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. Up, bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out now. This is AEW Unrestricted. I am Will Washington. She is Aubrey Edwards. We are BFFs, and we are talking about all things going on right now. Look, we just had uh, an incredible Blood and Guts that just passed. Blood and Guts is always one of my favorite events of the year. Um, getting to see that cage in person is like, I know for you, it's not. Oh, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, look, it's a very stressful match to like put together, like in, a, in the sense of having to format the entrances around commercial breaks is mm-hmm. something that I don't think people realize is a, like massive undertaking. Um, but we've pulled it off. Dude, giving time cues to wrestlers when you're not inside the cage is really freaking hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we're trying to create this mystique of like, craziness right but it's like hey by the way the next entrance is gonna happen in 30 seconds it's like Ugh. yeah <laughs> but but here we are uh and, and honestly um it is one of the most chaotic nights in aew chaos is like not something that no, we are strangers no. to though <laughs> i actually wanted to tell you the story speaking of chaos because crazy things happen all the time right like so there was that the episode of Dynamite recently where Samoa Joe was uh, choke slammed onto a pallet and then the forklift lifted him and then he was basically thrown through a wall because apparently um, when you press a brake on a forklift, the pallet goes flying, yes. <laughs> which I was not expecting to see until I saw a Samoa Joe going through the air into a wall and it was absolutely incredible. But fun little thing that happened after that, because we, as soon as that happens, chaos is happening. We're trying to figure out what happens. Doc calls the match, which is crazy. And then we uh, start loading Joe up onto the stretcher because he needs to get into the ambulance. So that show was happening in Calgary at the Stampede. So for those that don't know, Stampede is like this 10-day festival that's like a combination of a state fair with rodeo, with AEW with a bunch of other stuff. Like there's there's art exhibits, whatnot. It's this gigantic thing. So you have the Saddle Dome kind of in the middle of, of it all. So we come out of the Saddle Dome. Joe's on the stretcher. They're loading him up into the ambulance to take him away. And off in the distance, I kind of see someone on a golf cart beelining towards us. And as they get closer, it dawns on me that that person is like in official like Calgary stampede medical garb. And I'm like, oh no, they don't realize this is a television show. And I see Clark from the pre-tape team just like waving his arms at this person trying to stop That's them. That's a very Clark thing, yeah. Very, very Clark thing where he's like, he wants to scream, but he can't because like, you got like someone following at the boom mic and everything's going to get picked up in that moment. And I'm just like hoping they don't show up in the frame. Which is crazy because that's the thing Clark does best is like uh, when he can shout and get everybody quiet in a room and the fact that he can't do what he does best there. He's powerless. (laughs) (laughs) But yes, luckily we got Joe in the ambulance. The ambulance went away and then I walk over to the person like, hi, um, let me explain what happened. She's like, yeah, no one told me that there was an ambulance transport. So I rushed over to see if I could help. And I'm like, no, we're fine. You know, just a guy going on a pallet through a wall. No big deal. (laughs) And then to see the look of horror on her face. I'm like, you know what? Just another day at the office. So, you know, chaos. Just another day at the office. Yep. Chaos. Absolutely crazy. I love it. And you know what? Uh, This episode of AEW Unrestricted is more than just another day at the office because we've got a great guest. Who do we have here today? Today, we are joined by someone who is soft to the touch, always in style. (laughs) And the bread that cannot be toasted. <laughs> Daddy Magic, Matt Menard. How you doing, buddy? What's going on? You just read my Twitter bio? <laughs> <laughs> so we read it because like I'm I'm so curious. Like, please explain this. Like soft to the touch always in style I get, but the bread that can't be toasted. <laughs> Dude, don't think about it too much. Okay. All it's right. The issue with some of the things I say, people think about it too much. I, I think that is that is probably what it is, which is why it's so good that you're on commentary. People think about <laughs> what you're saying too much. It's just, just you just gotta listen. You gotta hear the feel the energy and just take it in. Feel the energy. But honestly, that that's what makes you work so well on commentary is that when you have those <laughs> types of phrases that 
identify with people, but they don't exactly know what they mean. I think that's the kind of stuff that goes forward. I remember I had a conversation with Taz and I had told him how much like the phrase rocket buster stuck with me, right? Because he used to describe matches that way on commentary. He'd be like, oh, this match is a rocket buster, Cole. And like, rocket buster. yeah. And like, I asked him one day, like, where did that come from? And he was like, I don't know. I heard it in a song and I just decided I was going to use it on TV. But it didn't like <laughs> mean anything. And I thought that was great. Right. What's a slobber knocker? I don't know. I don't <laughs> Sounds cool. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> We're going to start hearing Rocket Buster all of a sudden on Rampage. That's so funny. Oh, no biggie. <laughs> As a Rocket Buster. <laughs> but it's great, though, because officially you are a part of the Rampage commentary team. And, you know, you and I had had conversations about this beforehand uh, before it be officially became an official right. thing. Yeah. Tell me about it. How's it been so far? Uh, it's been awesome. It's been awesome. It's been awesome to know that, like, you, you got that spot there every every Friday night at 10 p.m. on TNT. Oh, um, yeah, that, that's it. Like, right. Working with um, uh, Shivani and, and Excalibur, typically, depending on when we uh, tape the, that show. Right. Because sometimes we'll, we'll tape it on the Saturday night for the prior week. When, when that happens, the, t- the team will change. But um, it's been awesome. I've always had like like a passion for, for commentary and announcing ever since I was a kid. And so to be able to to do that now um, on a full time basis, is it's the absolute best. So you said you had that passion for it since you were a kid. Like, where did that come from? Just watching sports, I think. Just watching sports. There's something about um, an announcer, a commentator who can um, take a moment and, ju- and just make it memorable and make it last and make it just burned into your memory. You know, um, growing up watching Hockey Night in Canada, every Saturday night, there's um, an announcer named Bob Cole, who uh, unfortunately just passed away three, four months ago, maybe at most. It was really recently. Yeah, yeah. It, it really wasn't that long ago. And he just he just has such a, a voice that that I, I could hear it right now, and I, I could do an impression. But I'll, I'll spare you. Um, an old friend, El Generico, could do a, one hell of a Bob Cole imp- impression. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you know, it's, it's the same thing with somebody like uh, Jim Ross. You know, everybody can do a Jr. impression. I think there's something to that, like that that voice. It it just it, oh man, it just cements it. It just hammers it home. the w- The moment that's happening in front it, happening in front of you just gets hammered home by the um by the announcer is the goal one day that there is a daddy magic impersonation that when people think of you on commentary, they can do a daddy magic voice and they can officially imitate you and imitate your isms. Well, I'll tell you what I, I think. I think that goes around the locker room already. I think everybody has oh, a yeah, daddy magic impression. <laughs> yeah. I, I think Tony Sports does a daddy magic impression from what I've heard. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Exactly. That, that is true that everybody at work has one. I think the goal doesn't mean it's bad. Like one day <laughs> doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> it is great though. That is the one. What everybody tell you got to have the hands. That is the, the hands are key. Get out of here! But everybody, everybody, everybody's a comedian. Everybody's a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not watching the video version of this podcast, you're really missing out because we're just doing a lot of hand <laughs> gestures right now. But that's like that's one of the things I love about talking with you just even behind the scenes is like when we first met, I'm like, man, this guy's like a freaking cartoon character on TV. Right. (laughs) Like, but no, that's, that's him in real life. It's, it's incredible. There's that saying in wrestling that like your character on TV is you just turned up to 11, but I don't think, I I think you are just default at 11. Like that's your standard. (laughs) (laughs) When I I walk into work, I'm, I'm more, the second I walk through the doors, I'm working. Right. (laughs) Exactly. To an extent, you know, for sure. I don't know. I don't know if I'm that guy at home all the time because that that would wear a bit thin, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> you know. Spe- speaking of home, we we were talking about this before we we started. The last time we had you on, it was either like right before or right after. Yeah. Uh, you had your son Jack. Yep. If you spend five minutes with you, you start talking about how much you love your son Jack and how great he is. And I've heard stories, and he's awesome. He actually popped by before Will showed up and waved and showed us some stickers. He was a super cute kid. How has life been now that you're the father of a toddler when you're on the road all the time? Yeah, it's tough. It's tough on um I don't want to say it's tough. I, I, I shouldn't say it. it's very easy on me. My 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 lovely wife, Stacy, uh, who who deals with this monster 24-7. It, it, it can get hard on her, especially um the last, I would say since November, I've done I might be, and somebody could correct me if they can, I might be the only talent who's done been doing do- both shows every single week. So I'm I'm gone. I've been gone quite a bit. It can be challenging for sure. I, I have noticed that that it, it's basically whenever I go to both Dynamite and Collision, it's usually I think it's like you and maybe like Sky Blue. I see at like every show. You're right. Sky Blue is is there quite a bit at, at both shows for sure. 
and there are talent that, that come and go and, and do both in a week. You know what I mean? But but it, it, it can get tough, especially at, at home. Like like today, he didn't. He just decided, yeah, I'm not going to nap. Oh. I'm not napping today. I mean, Will, you can speak to it. You have you have, you have children. It's like, <laughs> dude, we like those two hours in the afternoon when he naps, they're everything. Oh yeah. <laughs> but when they decide they don't want them anymore, it's like <laughs> it's, just, it's just like we're just trying to wrap our head around how are we going to deal without having those two hours. You know? Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's going to happen. It's soon. It's coming. Th- those toddler days are like the days I, I miss the most. Those are those days mm. where like, yeah, it-, it was fun teaching them things. And oh, just wait till the day that they decide to start teaching you things. And you're just like, what is oh, happening he, he, here? Who he does that? He'll do something like, like, I'll explain something to him. And then five seconds later, he'll try to explain it to me. Mm-hmm. It's like, th- th- didn't I just tell you how to do this? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? Like we were filling up gas the other day and I'm teaching him how to fill up gas in the car and then he tries to explain to me oh no that uh you take the the, the gun and like, what? <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> it's something it is something Hon- honestly the best days are still ahead yeah so uh talking up a little bit more about the commentary spot so of course rampage really was known for chris jericho having had that spot for a very very long time he was really there from the very beginning of rampage um which really stemmed out of uh his commentary spot during the pandemic so you really got to take the spot from Chris Jericho. Did he uh, have any advice for you or any words for you as you guys were essentially crossing ships? Uh, just be yourself. J- just be yourself. Do what you're doing. I'd already been doing it for, for, for quite a while. I started on uh, Dark Elevation. Do- I did that for just about a year, I would say. Yeah. Or like eight months, eight, nine months. I'd say from August until April, I'd, I think, with a number of different partners. I think like Ian, Excalibur, Tony would jump in. Big Show. Uh, sorry. Paul, Paul White. Obviously, so it was just it was it was just um just be yourself, just be yourself, have fun. Some of the best advice I ever received was um if you're having fun, the audience is going to be having fun, and I I just I always try to remember that you know just just make sure you're having a good time because e- even if you like oh you you call a move wrong or I mean it's not my job to call the moves but like if you mess up if your words aren't right or or something but as long as your energy is is that of of somebody who's having a good time that will translate to the audience at home. You know, and, and I think that that is what I took away from Chris's commentary for sure. No doubt about it. So you you mentioned a lot of really awesome names there with Paul and Ian and Tony and Chris and everybody, right? Yeah. Having kind of your footing on Dark Elevation with Paul White for a bit, what would you say was the biggest change or maybe the thing that surprised you most going from something like Dark Elevation to Rampage? Oh, man. The toughest part about it, I think, is so... Elevation was a was a YouTube show. Mm-hmm. It wasn't network tele or cable television. It wasn't um, it wasn't live. It was it was almost um, more laid back. I would say there, there was a lot less um, almost pressure. And what was so great about it being a new uh, commentator announcer was I could grow and I could experiment and I could take a risk. And if I somehow messed up or something didn't work or it was okay, it, it didn't matter. Not that it didn't matter, but that that's where you do it. That's where you make your mistake. You know what I mean? I think it was, it's the same thing for the. Um, I want to say for the wrestlers, right? Absolutely. They could experiment in, in, in that scenario. And I, I think almost maybe, I, I, w- I wish we could get that back so, somehow. You know what I mean? A place where we, we could just make mistakes and, and it's okay and experiment and try something new. Uh, the, the, there was something um, really fun about that, I think. But moving to, to Rampage, obviously the, um, the, the pressure goes up, right? And the pressure goes up. You're working with uh, the, the, top, the top announcers, Tony Schiavone, Excalibur, the real fun, though, is when we did some of those live rampages, like right after Dynamite, right? Mm-hmm. The, we would do these three-hour blocks. We would have Dynamite going right into Rampage on uh, Wednesday nights or something. We did on Saturday. Collision right into Rampage at, at 10 p.m., you know? And whoo, that you feel I get goosebumps just thinking about it. That's fun, man. No net. Oh, boy. What, what's Daddy Matthew going to say? I don't know. I don't even know what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, tune in and find out. I, I am genuinely a big fan of those blocks, and so like, and it's great because the giving the the Wednesday audience kind of a taste of what they might be missing on Fridays, I think, is is always great. And I think that getting to do that live, and I, I, I think for the audience to not fully understand, or who that maybe doesn't understand what you mean by, because both are essentially tape shows, Rampage and Elevation, but uh, or Elevation yeah. at the time. But I think the the structure of them is so much different, right? You didn't have to deal with commercial oh, yeah. breaks. Um, you didn't have to deal with the picture in picture and having to change essentially the the cadence of what you're doing during the picture in picture, anything like that. Like it, it truly is a oh, fully different experience, but one where you really can't, could cut your teeth. 
to your point, yeah, th- thanks for bringing that up. Like just dealing with the commercial breaks or having um like elevation, there's nobody talking in your ear. You're not really being produced by anybody, right? It's just kind of do your thing. But then when you when you come to the um, the television, yeah, there's somebody in your ear telling you, counting you down. Just think about it. You have headphones on and somebody's talking to you. This was a real lesson. Like, oh, oh, somebody's talking to you, but you're supposed to keep talking as you're here getting the instructions. Yep. It's so insane. <laughs> it's so insane. So to train that muscle is, uh, yeah, that, that, that took some getting used to. Um, I remember doing my, I think I've only done one, like, like B-roll, right? So they'll play a clip of, oh, th- let's take it back to Wednesday night. Here's what happened. And you kind of like commentate the clip. I'm, I'm getting counted down in my head. I didn't, I had planned kind of what I had wanted to say for the, for the B-roll clip. But I didn't realize I'd be getting counted down. So when I started getting counted down, I just started to listen to, to Mansuri, who was talking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> said, oh, no, you're supposed to be talking, Matt. <laughs> Keep talking. I know exactly what you're talking about because I'll get counted down into break yes. in my headset as I'm in the ring. But I'm telling someone like, hey, get out of the corner. And I'm trying to like, hey, get out of the five, four, three. And I'm yeah, trying not yes. to say the thing that they're telling me exactly. while still like yeah. changing volumes. It's so... Oh man, for people that don't understand, that is like one of the most stressful parts of the job. It's like processing information. It's crazy. <laughs> and the hard part is being on the other side of that, where like if I'm producing a segment or if I'm just yeah. uh, sitting and go with Tony and literally, you know, having to like get a note to commentary or something along those lines. Where yes. It's like, hey, make sure you bring this yes. up. But you guys are literally talking in that moment. And it's like, I don't want right. to disrupt what you're saying, but I got to get this point to you guys. And so it's little things like that where like, I, I feel really bad because I don't know what it's like to receive that, but I know what it's like to have to give it to you oh, guys. Brother. I, remember, I remember TK would say something and I'm just like, so so to your point, like we're in the moment talking about what's happening and he'll make a comment like, oh, get this in about what's happening right now. Uh-huh. Let's say the other Tony's talking and I'm just like, uh, do, do I just cut him off and say what TK was saying? Like, <laughs> and, and then the, the moment's kind of gone. So you got to figure a way to like bring it back in. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's been awesome. It's been an awesome uh, learning experience. And that is the major difference from doing a dark elevation or rampage collision, especially the live shows, your dynamites and your collisions, for sure. This has already been a completely just like eye-opening conversation, just talking to you about this stuff. And we've got more coming this up why. here on AEW Unrestricted. <laughs> AEW Unrestricted, it's Will Washington, it's Aubrey Edwards, but most importantly, we're talking with our guest, Daddy Magic, Matt Menard. Daddy Magic was really something that was born uh, to the audience out of the Jericho Appreciation Society. So good. And really, that was where people truly got to know the personality that is Daddy Magic that I think people were really kind of familiar with 2.0 as a tag team as you guys came in and then you guys with Daniel Garcia as a trio. But really, it was that kind of shift with the JAS where all of a sudden people got to learn what makes Daddy Magic's nipples hard. And so, (laughs) uh, which is not a statement I never thought I'd make on a podcast, but all of a sudden I get to. So uh, first off, how did that all come about? How was the approach made for you to officially join Jericho? Um, so we kind of uh, had a, had a little bit of a like a mini feud, I would I'd say with with Chris and um, Eddie Kingston. It was all kind of tied in there at the end of 2021, early 2022. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, it was forever ago. Yeah, yeah, it really was a long time ago. And Chris and I will still talk about it to this day. Actually, every time we're in the Wind Trust, they'll go, "This is where you smashed me with that chair." We did <laughs> we did like a backstage <laughs> interview where we interrupted Chris, and and I, I he's like, "Just you make." He tells me, he "Goes make sure you bring it." And I go all right. So I just smashed him in the face as hard as I could. And then we had to do a second take because like, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause there was like a boom mic, like hanging in the shot and they, they wanted to be clean. Damn it, George. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yes. Chris got so mad. <laughs> you don't want to piss Chris off, you know? No. So we had to do it again. The second one was a little lighter. And the second one was a little lighter. <laughs> well, uh, was it, was he still red faced at the top of it though? It's like one of those things where, Oh, <laughs> oh, it's furious. Like yeah. Having already taken that shot. It was furious. I know that feeling, though. I, I absolutely know that feeling of, like, you think everything went absolutely perfect, and then yeah. all of a sudden you go back and rewatch it, and, yeah, you see the little... You see lit- literally anything could happen, right? There's something will sneak into yeah. the background. A shadow. A talent that shouldn't have been to in me, the shot just, walked like, just by. Leave the boom mic there. Yeah, but the boom mic is always the to worst. To me, I would have just left it there. Like, it's fine. We're just like, we interrupted an interview, it was a whole thing. It's chaos. Leave the boom mic. It doesn't have to be clean. You know, it's fine, guys. But um, moving from like doing that little feud, 
I think he was looking to make a switch. You know, I think he was looking to get out of the inner circle. Like he had felt like that had run its course. And then it's like, he wants to have something on, on the table for what's next. And he chose us. He literally just chose us. Uh, I, I say this all the time to, to some of the younger guys. You have to put yourself in a position to be successful and in a position to, to get lucky. Sometimes you just have to get lucky. You have to get a break. You have to be chosen. And um, this was very much one of those instances where, where, where we got chosen to be a part of this, you know, and um, man, I owe a lot. I owe a lot to Chris for choosing us for that spot for, for Tony Khan, for letting Chris run with it. You know, it changed my life. It really did. I can't remember the question, but I could go on about Chris forever, you know? Well, you know, it's it's interesting because, like I said, it was really what put you on the map for a lot of fans. And I think that even just having your voice yeah. be the first thing everybody heard in the intro, right? Like, I feel like that. Entertainers. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you guys got to enter to the ring, you were the first voice people heard. And all of a sudden, I feel like that really established your identity with the AEW fans. It's fun. It's funny. Like those. So to your point before earlier, you, you had mentioned being part of 2.0 with the tag team with, and with Jeff Parker at the time, being in a group of, of four or five or six guys that ended up being eight at the end. It really, it sounds crazy, but it allowed me to be more of an individual. You have to, it's how you stand out. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So I was able to show a little bit more personality and a little bit of, of more who, uh, of who I am. And th that was a real blessing of, of the JAS. It really was. And so about the nipples, about the, uh, <laughs> you want to know what makes Daddy Magic's nipples all hard? I do. I will never forget. We, I don't know if it was a celebration or, you know, Chris always lo loves these segments, right? These celebratory segments. I can't remember what the heck we were celebrating, but it was something. Maybe we destroyed Eddie Kingston. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. I think it was in a April of 2022. We're in Long Island. And I wanted to say, um, do you want to know what turns Daddy Magic on? Or do you want to know what turns me on? That was the line I wanted to use. And in the afternoon, Chris just kind of like blase, like, oh, this is what I'm going to say, Chris. And he goes, all right, well, why don't you say, uh, well, so what, what makes Daddy Magic's nipples hard? But he just kind of said it like he wasn't serious. You know what I mean? I didn't think he was, I didn't think he was being serious with what he said. And then right before we go out, well, I'm, I'm going over it. We're, we're kind of walking through it. And I say, well, this is what I'm going to say. Um, do you want to know what turns me on? He goes, no, no, no. You're going to say, do you want to know what makes my nipples hard? I said, no, I'm going to say what turns me on. And we kind of had a little bit of an argument. Right. Who the hell am I to be arguing with Chris Jericho? And then Jake Hager steps in and he goes, why don't you say both? I said, okay, so I said both. The nipples <laughs> line got way more of a reaction. Just a of course. way bigger reaction. Mm -hmm. Of course. And then, so, so I write, I text Chris afterwards. I go, yeah, all right. You were right, Chris. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, maybe I know something, Matt. <laughs> maybe he knows a thing or two about catchphrases. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe he does. And he could not have been more right. He, uh, man, that that people love that thing to this day. Every time I tweet something, I can't, I can't, you know, look at my mentions without having a, a nipples reference there. You know, it's interesting because uh, I was recently going over all of the blood and guts matches. I was thinking about what was the second blood and guts match in 2022. Yeah, we got to see a real personality and almost comedic side of you guys but then coming out of blood and guts we really got to see some intensity coming out of mm -hmm. you specifically and i remember a promo you had done for social that really really got over yeah. so i i wanted to ask about that experience and all of a sudden you guys getting pulled into this main event story with the jas with the bcc with everything that was going on at that point with uh as a matter of fact the story i don't think i've ever told you with anarchy in the arena my wife and I were in the crowd for the first anarchy in the arena. Uh -oh. And oh, you no, came don't tell me I bled on you. You did all over her foot. <laughs> <laughs> and she had flip flops on too, so it was like oh, uh, her bare yeah. foot and she got Daddy Magic's blood uh, all over. Yeah. I'm well, you tell your wife I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> this is the best part though. So she goes into the restroom to to wash her foot off. And I guess by that point, you guys had made your way into the, the lobby. And then so she like opens the door. Yeah. You guys are brawling right in front of the restaurant <laughs> door. She can't escape oh it. Oh, my God. She's like, I can't escape Did this. The, the second you said I have an anarchy in the arena story with my wife, I knew that's where it was going. I knew <laughs> that it was going to be that I blood on her. Yep. I, I take full credit for us not being allowed to uh, bleed in the crowd anymore at the T-Mobile arena <laughs> in Las Vegas. That's all on me, guys. 
Uh, what a time that was, though. I, honestly, that was an experience. That was an experience to just be there. And uh, like, I thought that was one of the coolest experiences I ever had genuinely <laughs> just watching professional wrestling. But then, like I said, you had kind of two major moments there. You got to have Anarchy in the arena. And then uh, immediately following that, you got to do Blood and Guts. And that was really like a big step into the main event scene for for you specifically. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that time. Yeah, no, that was huge. Those two matches, man. Those huge main event matches. I mean, I, I, I'll call uh, Anarchy in the Arena main event of a pay-per-view, even though it didn't go on last. It should have. I, th I think it was definitely a selling point of that show. Uh, Blood and Guts, the, uh, the next month in Detroit, go over 10,000 tickets sold on Dynamite, over a million uh, watching. Uh, it was awesome. It was awesome. To be in the ring with all those guys and in that moment, how many world champions are, are in that match, are in these mm -hmm. matches, right? You, you got Chris, you got, Hager, you got uh, Brian, you got Moxley. Just a huge, huge match, guys. And uh, to be a part of that was just very special to be bleeding. There's just something about bleeding and sweating and 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 just being at the point of exhaustion in, in, in front of all these people. Just that's that's what that's what it's all about right there. It's everything you live for, man. It is everything you live for. And then to cut those the promo afterwards, I, I think is what the, the question was about, right? Is just mm -hmm. oh, man, so that blood and guts promo so my son jack who aubrey you just saw was th about to be three years old he was um 10 months old at that time he had just taken his first um steps walking quite literally we were at yeah uh the rehearsal for blood That's and guts the night before and yeah. you were showing people yep. on your phone like look jack's yep. walking and we we're all really excited about yeah. it but i don't think the gravity of that moment hit me until you did your promo yeah yeah you know i don't think the moment hit, i don't think it hit me until i i did the promo you know what I mean? Because it's just like, oh, yeah, I'll see him walk when I get home. I'll see him walk for the rest of my life, you know? And then there was something about, man, finishing that match. And I had also, I had hurt my shoulder. I had torn my um, my labrum and my rotator cuff. And I, I knew it. I knew something was wrong, you know? And we're in the middle of this, of this the, the biggest push of our lives, right, mm -hmm. um, at that time. And to be in these matches, it was just so much emotion, the, just bleeding in that moment. Knowing I was hurt, being as exhausted I was ap after the main events, then they put a camera in front of you, and there's just no plan of, of what you're going to say, no goal, no, oh, we're building towards nothing, just pure, raw, just what are you feeling right now? And that was it. That is just what came out. Tears started flowing, and that was literally as real as it gets right there. That was as real as it gets. To be able to communicate my feelings, right? Because you never know if that's going to come out well. I think I was able to do that. and. A credit to the team in, in Nashville who put together an incredible package with the, they, they had the music and the cuts and, and the showing your face bleeding and, and the, the moves from the match and this and that. And they did it just an absolute beautiful job with that. Uh, so, sometimes I miss those, those road twos. You remember those? Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Definitely one of my favorite series for getting people into uh, any particular angle or just coming out of a match. Those were always yeah. Really good, really excellent stuff. And it's just, it's like just, just for the boys, there's an opportunity there to, to share your story, you know? Mm -hmm. Just tell people what you're about. Man, yeah, I love it. I love it, guys. Yeah, always great. And this is always great conversation with Daddy Magic, Matt Menard. This is AEW Unrestricted. We've got more after this. AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey and Will with Daddy Magic, Matt Menard. Question whether or not his nipples are hard right now. I'm going to say yes. Are they hard? Oh, yeah, they're, they're all, yeah, they're hard. They're a little hard. We've got the AC going here at home. <laughs> it's a little you know? breeze, a little breeze down there. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I had a whole plan for how I was going to open this, and it just went out the rails. Oh, my God. <laughs> anyway, um, I actually want to chat. Yes, question. Yeah. What, what question? What What is this, a podcast? <laughs> so the last time we had you on, it was you and at the time, Jeff Parker, now Angelo Parker, Cool Hand Ange, yeah. who has since, you know, gone on to meet his new wife and he's expecting a baby soon. And it's so wonderful. Like they're yeah. being first time parents. What is that like for you to kind of having gone through that recently, like on the road with everything that has happened to see one of your childhood best friends kind of experiencing all of this for the first time? Yeah, no, it's very, it's, it's very exciting. I'm excited for him. I'm happy for uh, for Ruby. I'm I'm happy for for Jeff's mother to to finally become a grandmother. Like that is is something that's very exciting. I don't know. Part of me feels like that's what we're put on this earth to do, right? To procreate and and I don't know. It's it's just it's 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 something very unique, and I'm happy for him that he's uh, going to get to experience that. You know, 
it's going to be awesome. And it has its challenges. And I don't know how they're going to do it with um, both of them being uh, wrestlers. Like, that is something. Yeah, that I, yeah I, I didn't have to deal with that. I see Sammy and, and Tay are about to uh, kind of embark on that journey themselves, right? Because Luna is 10 months or so, eight months old now. Mm -hmm. Tay is just about ready to come back, I think. So, yeah, they're going to have to deal with that too. Uh, and that's why that is something I don't have to deal with. That's a whole nother level, I think, right? When when mommy is also a wrestler. <laughs> that's wild. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Hats off to them. And you mothers are saints. Mothers are saints. No question about it. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the story that unfolded on screen with Ruby and Jeff. Yeah. Very specifically because, you know, I, I was obviously a part of all of that coming together and and the story in itself. And I remember because it was one of those things where like nobody knew about them as a couple outside. Dude, I found out like three months later. <laughs> <laughs> they just hung out together all the time and then one day they were dating. Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, like something like that. I found out my second day on the job. Well, you always yeah. find out shit before me. So that, that yeah, it, it had to have been my second day on the job. I, but it was one of those things that I was like, that is nowhere, nowhere on the internet, nowhere on. Nope. And so what I loved about that is that when we turned it into a story on TV, of course, the announcement of Ruby's pregnancy came out. All the internet fans were like, wow, they really turned an angle into real life. And it was yeah. like, no, it was completely <laughs> the other way around. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Like it's a. It, it seamlessly happened, you know? I mean, yeah, nobody knew. They they, they kept it um, probably the way that it should be done, you know? You, you got to keep that yeah. thing uh, under wraps, make sure. I, I don't know, you know? I can't really speak to it. You'll have to ask him about it, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I especially want to talk to them uh, after the... Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to talk specifically <laughs> about your involvement in the story um, because as it went yeah. on, uh, you were not... Daddy Magic was not happy with... Uh, any of these happenings. Daddy Magic did not want to see his friend. <laughs> Daddy Magic, yeah, he doesn't like change. Yes. I don't like change. You know, I, I, I go to the restaurant. They always order the same thing. I always order the same thing. It's very much the same, the same way in my life with partners. I don't like the change, guys. You know what I mean? It, you, you ruffle the feathers. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? Now? You throw a woman in the mix. You throw a baby in the mix. Now life's getting crazy. You know, baby gets sick. The wife gets sick. Now, now he has other priorities. I want to be the priority. <laughs> because, uh, you know, what was that much of the character right it was where his head was you know what i mean and, and of course it, it led to um some great interactions between you and soraya some great facial expressions between you awesome. guys uh we did that one that one uh, backstage um and we just ended up looking at each other and, and like it just oh just felt this magic like like i wish we could have like explored that more you know what i mean and maybe we will in the future but Nah, God, I loved working with, with Soraya for sure. Yeah, I loved sort of this whole thing. And it kind of, it's odd because I don't think the finish of sort of the storyline happened the way that everyone wanted. Because it's like, well, one of the key people literally cannot physically wrestle for a while. So maybe we have to put a little That's pause it. on yes, this. Yes, exactly. So I, I think yeah, yeah, getting pregnant uh, threw a wrench in the plans, I'd say. Yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those like, well, it's, it's actually the best thing for the story, <laughs> but kind of the worst thing for the story. <laughs> like we definitely had like a much longer term payoff for this. But, 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 look, but that's, that is life. That is how things go down, right? Right. That's how, that's how things happen, man. Like the same thing happens with wrestling, right? Like sometimes people get injured. They have to go off TV for a bit. Like so many unpredictable things happen. Absolutely. You just never expect it to be like, oh, the two people that were legitimately in a storyline uh, about falling in love with each other fell in love. <laughs> now they had a baby. That's just life. You just got to roll with the punches, man. That's the beautiful thing about wrestling. You just roll with it. You just roll mm -hmm. with it. And it's, it's, this is live TV every week. What are we doing? Five hours every single week? You All know, right. not everything's going to be perfect. Like you said, people get hurt. People get pregnant. Hey, here we go. <laughs> That's just how it is. That's what it is. You had mentioned the last segment, sort of like even just blood and guts looking at all like the, the different champions that were all in the ring at the same time, like Anarchy in the Arena, yeah. Chris Jericho, all these guys who have been like huge legends. You also had the opportunity to work with Sting and Darby oh, with a Texas Tornado match back in yeah. 2021, which is crazy. Yeah, Houston. That was Sting's first yeah. TV match. What? Uh, yeah. So of course, Sting had only wrestled on pay per view at that point, and that That's was the right. first time yeah. Sting had competed in a TV match, and yeah. that that had to have been a huge honor for you guys. It was so well, and call me crazy. I think it's the only match that Sting has done since like he came back that where he wasn't wearing a t shirt. Like he was, this guy was ready to go. That he was night. jacked. He was he like he, <laughs> he wore the, he wore like the um 
the, the classic stinger singlet. He was tanned on point, looked unbelievable, jacked, confident. Uh, he was so ready to go that night. Um, oh, God, do I love that match. That match, um, I mean, I think got it helped get us our full-time jobs, honestly, you know, at the end of the day. Um, just very, very special. He was ready to go. The, the I remember at one point, Sting is just raining punches down on me, and the, and the crowd's counting along, and I'm just like, oh, God, this is how wrestling's supposed to be, mm-hmm. right? The big star, and everybody loves him, and you're bumping for him. It's just so easy. It's supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be hard, you know? And it was it was a real um, eye-opening experience to, to be in there with a, a guy the caliber of Sting and Darby. My God, what a psycho this guy is. Just an absolute psycho. That had to have been really special, too, just thinking about how that was only a month uh, back on the road. Oh, that's right. Coming out of COVID. Yeah. So hearing that crowd reaction, hearing everybody going nuts for the punches. And I, I remember like I was watching at home and I just I got out of my seat when would sting uh, literally after he gets up after the uh, the table spot. Yeah. Oh, he does. He does. Uh, uh, the chest, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Crazy. What a crazy freaking guy. So so to bring it back to commentary, there's he, he does. He gets up from the, the table spot. We turn around. Darby drop kicks us and he snatches us both. Like for the double uh, slop drop, the double scorpion death drop. And Tony Schiavone just yells, double scorpion death drop. Come on, baby. But the come on, baby is just like etched in my brain, you know? <laughs> it's just this moment that he adds on top of it with it with his commentary. And that's not planned. That is just something of 30 years of experience in the moment where he just he just felt it and he said it and it just it worked. It was beautiful. It's I mean, you kind of said that early on that like these moments in time are sort of like made by the commentary along with them. Yeah. So with that sort of statement of the Tony Schiavone saying, come on, baby, yeah. do you approach wrestling different now that you do commentary as frequently as you do? It's funny that you asked that. It, it certainly made me um, more aware of how much power a commentator has mm-hmm. as far as telling the story. And so sometimes in the middle, I'll, I'll be ca- calling a match. I'm like, oh, guys, can, can we slow down? Can we slow down here? Because we want to tell these these certain story points that that we want to convey to the audience that will help everybody. Sometimes you just can't because the action is just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, so there's never a breath for the commentators to have a little conversation about to put over the story. So that definitely opened my eyes and I think helped me approach matches a little bit differently. Absolutely. You know, if we take a breath here, the commentators could say this, this, and this. I didn't even think about it that way, but yeah, kind of like adding yeah. pacing for commentary in your matches. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So, so been very blessed in, in, in that light, you know, that's a really interesting thought. I never even considered that. Yeah. It's almost like how we always tell wrestlers, like take the time to sell. It's like, that's the opportunity for you guys to kind of like say stuff, right? Yeah. Yes. In, in those moments where you're selling, the announcers are talking mm-hmm. and they're talking about wh- what you're selling or maybe whatever the, the story was building up to the match, you know? And that, that just helps the audience at home understand everything that's happening. Even more of a reason for these damn kids to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> what? Look, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. Please do, do everything, please. Oh, please, I'll be please. that guy for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that, that begs the question, kind of bringing it full circle. And I think if this podcast can be something that you look back on at the beginning of essentially of your commentary career, how do you feel you want to be remembered as a commentator? Mm. The greatest color guy to ever do it. I don't, I don't think there's any question like in my mind. If, if I get an opportunity to do this for 20, 25 years, I'll be the greatest. Uh, <laughs> don't play this for Taz, please. I'll <laughs> um, be the greatest to ever do it. <laughs> I mean, that's my goal. That's my goal, no question, you know? And I'll take everything that all those guys that have taught me, man, Taz, JR, Sh- Shivani, Excalibur, everybody, man. They've all kind of taken me under their wing um, in their own ways, even though they won't admit it. They'll never admit it, and, and they still won't let me in the announcer's room. <laughs> it's their space. <laughs> I love them, man. <laughs> Yeah, they've been they've been really good to me. They've been really, really good to me. Of course, it's it's been awesome to see you grow in your commentary role. It's been awesome to see you in all of your various different tracksuits that you wear at work. (laughs) One of my favorite things every week is seeing what tracksuit Daddy Magic wore on the plane. (laughs) It's so incredible having the time to talk with you today and to see you at this point in your career. And absolutely, I 100 percent believe you will be considered one of those guys like way down the line, Matt Menard was the voice of my generation. Like people will say that about you is the same way they say it about Tony Schiavone and Excalibur and all these other guys. So no pressure. Well, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) you. Yeah. That's the goal, man. The voice of a generation. That's, it's, that's a wild thought to think about. 
But yeah, that that's the goal at the end of the it's day. It's definitely feasible. You could do it, man. You're killing it. I love it. Thank you, guys. And I, I think you'll be the one to do it. You know, I've had this cor- conversation with you privately, and I'm a big believer in Daddy Magic as a commentator. And uh, I definitely want to make sure I get that point out there publicly as well. <laughs> Thank you, Will. We knew before everyone else did. That's that's it. We're gonna we're gonna make sure we knew. <laughs> so when people go back and go, Mark who saw down. this happening? It's like there is actual recorded <laughs> evidence that this happened. Anyway, thank you for being here today, Matt. Thank you everyone for listening. We have new episodes of AEW Unrestricted every Thursday on all of your favorite podcast platforms. You can tune into the video versions typically the next week after. You can see us all make a lot of hand gestures as we're trying to do our Matt Menard impression. Yes, a lot of emphasis on the words with the hands right. you watch dynamite on tbs on wednesdays you can you can listen to this man in his beautiful voice <laughs> friday's rampage tnt you can watch collision saturdays on tnt and you can watch ring of honor on honor club every thursday i am aubrey edwards with will washington we talked to matt menard daddy magic here on aew unrestricted thank you for listening everybody come on throw your hands up let me see you unrestricted got the house now we gonna turn it